Good morning. I'm Mr. Bank Joshua Garcia Billings. It's an honor to be here today amongst all you Webbies and industry. If I did not go to the Merchant Marine Academy, I would have actually applied here. I found out about it last minute. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it really is an honor. I don't, I'm not just saying that lightly. This uh, past year, actually, I was aboard Coast Guard Cutter Polar Star with Mitch Menklema, who has just left. But uh, <laughs> he was a great cadet to work with, um, serving five months aboard Polar Star in uh, harsh Antarctic operational conditions. It was very, it was very hard, and he was a good shipmate. So, speaks to all of you very well. So, without further ado, um, today's presentation will begin with insight to our motivation, history, and background, sailing rig calculations, comparison to a motor ship, cargo considerations, and of course, conclusions, future work, and acknowledgments from our staff. So why do we care about Flannery Motors? What is it? Well, Flannery Motors is a wind-powered technology used in today's shipping industry. We care because we want greenhouse gases to be reduced. We want emissions lowered. That is what regulations are calling for, and that is what prices the economy is calling for. So Flettner Rotors are a modern day sailing technology that we can use to help reduce emissions and to help the economy in a certain way with technology generation. For example, CO2 emissions are projected to increase by as much as 50 to 250% in just almost 25 years. And while efficient measures are being optimized, it must continue to be prioritized especially in light of stringent regulations. Then the purpose is to address reduced hydrocarbons from ship emissions by use of flattener rotors and to further greenhouse, excuse me, further develop green technologies. A little bit of background. What is the Magnus effect? We take a cylinder such as this pen, we rotate it faster and faster, and a fluid such as air or water, in this case, especially air, and it will generate a force of lift. It is the primary principle behind Flettner rotors. So maybe I didn't do a good job of explaining this. We take this cylinder, we put it upright onto a ship, multiple even, and we'll have them spinning faster and faster. And that can help take the load off of engines and help provide a force of lift for the ship so that it can move. The Magnus effect is the primary principle. It was first discovered in 1852 by Gustav Magnus. It was first used in the maritime industry approximately 1895 by Captain LaCroix on board a sampan with gears. So here I provided a few real world examples. As you can see, vertical cylinders, and of significant note are these discs at top, which help stabilize and provide a greater coefficient of lift and drag. We have the first instance is the E ship one in 2008, and has slowly but steadily been increasing in terms of utilization within industry. Other wind power technologies do exist. We have wing sails, such as what you might see on an airplane, but vertical wings. We also have turbo sails and even heights. However, Flettner rotors are the most significant because as of now, they are most predominant in the industry. In fact, we can increase thrust, excuse me, in comparison to conventional sails, Flettner rotors can generate lift as much as 10 times, at least 10 times or more. To explore the optimization of Flettner rotors aboard, the ship, aboard ships, we used CFD, computational fluid dynamics. 
There are many factors to consider. One of the most significant is the lift to diameter ratio, lift to drag ratio, wind speed and wind direction, all of which will be explored in this presentation. It's important to know that we used a program called Easy CFD. There are many CFD programs out there, but we have probably one of the most basic ones, and that's just because that's all our academy provides for. We cannot do things in 3D, which is kind of a shame, but we make do. In turn, we have supplemented our experimental analysis with considerations which have already been priorly investigated. Finally, the 3D printed prototype is to be tested on a scaled model of a type two C2 class cargo ship. Here we can see a 3D rendition rendered in real life of our modeled Kletner rotors. They were made at our academy and are to be used aboard a scaled cargo ship with height to diameter ratios of 5.26 and 4.98 respectively. Here we can see uh, our ship that we used. We have, on the left, you can see the hole that we used. We used steel plates to reach its correct design draft. We also restored it and strengthened it so that we could actually use it in our small tank. On the right, you can see what it would ideally look like in industry in the model form, of course. And then of course we have our statistics with respect to model and SI units on the right and the, excuse me, the model and then what it should be on the left. So to investigate how it works, we first investigated three parameters. First, we tested the diameter. We held the rotation of the flattener rotors and the wind speed constant, so we could focus on how diameter increasing or decreasing affects our lift component. And it turns out that there is a linear relationship between lift and rotor uh, diameter. Here you can see the applied CFD Nice, pretty pictures, but the most important part is the red region, which corresponds with the lift component. Next, we varied the rotation speed itself. Holding wind speed and diameter constant provided a similar linear result, which is an increase in lift. And here we can see perhaps more chaotic yet still useful data results, which conveys to us lift. Finally, we varied wind speed itself. We held rotor diameter and rotational speed constant to test this. And while there is also a linear relationship here between lift, it appears that there is a greater drop-off point where increasing the rotational speed no longer proves to be useful. And that is largely due to drag. Drag renders, at a certain point, rotational speed less useful upon increasing it. Here we can see another CFD rendition of this. While we held those three variables constant, we played around more with how rotor configurations affect lift. So consider CFD to be something that you can use analytically, but that also has an art form. And this art form is the rotor configuration itself. How many rotors to include and where to place them is what makes CFD an art in this particular case. We investigated three primary rotor configurations, inline, side-by-side, -side, and staggered or in weight. As you can see, inline is rendered in blue, side-by-side -side is rendered in orange, 
and in wake or staggered is rendered in gray. And as we can see, the highest lift to drag ratio is the side-by-side -side configuration, but the most optimal, the highest total lift net is the in wake staggered configuration. Here's a better visual representation of what each configuration entails. And this is where the art comes in. How much do you space it by? How many to include? Do you include it forward or aft? And where is it relative to the wind versus the vessel's direction of motion? So the in-weight configuration was the most applicable for chipboard application just due to the availability of CFD simulations total. And rotor speeds were reduced 0.3 meters. Total lift was lower compared to lift value shown in the next one, in the next slide. But what's important to know is that maximum propulsion was achieved with the vessel perpendicular to the wind at 90 degrees, which is as expected. If the vessel is facing zero degrees or 180 degrees, well, it's harder to really gain any useful insight into the ship and how it moves or operates. Of course, the other factor we considered was increasing the number of rotors. In addition to more rotors, the in-weight configuration was investigated and of course, the four, the more you have, the four rotor configuration was the most ideal as total lift force increased the most. With this information, it proved very useful to us, but there was one more thing we wanted to test. And that was to compare it to other types of wings, wind sailing technology. Now, due to our limited time and resources, prior research was used instead of us being able to conduct in-house experimental analysis. However, there was one particular study which proved to be very useful, showing over a series of different types of ships, how each wind technology is optimized for each ship. The most comparable ideally is the wing sail, and is also the most interesting in comparison to the flattener rotor. However, as we will see in the next slides, the flattener rotor remains the most optimal for ship industry use. Here we have polar coordinate graphs. Given any angle except zero and 180 degrees, flattener rotor has the best versatility at various wind speeds compared to something like the wing sail. It has the highest thrust to force propulsion force at any wind angle, except zero or 180. In comparison, wing sail technology has similar characteristics, but less versatility at any given angle. In turn, it has compar slightly comparatively less power generation. Another interesting when technology involves the towing kite. Here it is significantly worse than either the wing sail or the flattener rotor because, well, it's how it operates is fundamentally different. Its sole advantage is that it does not take up space on the deck of the vessel, which would be useful for a cost to benefit analysis. And then finally, we have the wind turbine itself. It is more obscure, less used in industry, provides less lift force out of all of the observed wind technologies. So in conclusion, we were able to, with CFD, experimentally and analytic analytically, prove that there is a direct proportional relationship where an increase in a flattener rotor diameter results in an increased lift. Similarly, there's another direct relationship between rotational speed and resulting lift. And from this, and most significantly, is this idea that a four staggered flattener rotor configuration is best observed, is the best observed option due to the max addition of thrust. Additionally, 
what we can play around with is having one flattener rotor up front at the bow and one at the stern allows us to greater turn the vessel, which is especially important while maneuvering in port and out of port. Of course, we would love to consider further investigations, some of which ideally would include a more thorough CFD analysis with 3D capabilities and CFD calculations with different sizes and configurations. In a more hands-on approach, we would also like to use a greater towing tank and the use of end caps. That is one thing we did not consider, which if we had more time, would have loved to pursue. And finally, we would also like to explore how placement of each of these affects the ship's center of gravity. So that's the end of the main presentation. Of course, we respect and acknowledge all of our staff at the US Merchant Marine Academy and you guys for making this happen. Thank you very much. Any questions? If there are no questions. Oh no. Everyone else wants to come to lunch. Is it Is there not for those service problems for a flat in the road around 30 minutes? That is one more parameter we would have liked to explore. This was kind of just the basic rend the most basic rendition we could use in a timely manner. Um so when you did the physical <laughs> What prompted you to choose to uh, build the rotors with 3D printing instead of, say, a lathe or something? Since, as far as I understand, it's effectively a spinning cylinder. It was mainly due to time and, yeah, time. At our school, it is just simply easier to manufacture something with 3D printing in comparison to taking time to use a lathe, calculate, and, and basically just to use the lathe. Um, it has more limited lab hours. So obviously the goal of this is to alleviate um, how much the engine is working, but how much power is actually required to spin these cylinders at a speed that's um, viable? So that's another thing we would have liked to explore given more time. It really depends. It depends on the wind speed. The higher the wind speed, the less the engines have to work. One interesting thing that is actually related to the historical piece is that these gears, these, these cylinders were rotated initially by gears to get them spinning up starting first, and then the wind would help supplement that and take the ease off the operator. We would have liked to explore that, but again, time constraint. Uh, you said that these committees had to have artificial sales. That comparison to like a square rig ship like the 18th century, or is that like in comparison to modern? That's in comparison to like an 18th century ship. Did you consider more than four rotors? We did, but that's that's where the art form comes in, and uh, that's that's a rabbit hole you can go down. Do you do four? Do you do five? How many should you stop at? And due to our time, we determined that four was most realistic to what a ship might and utilize. Did not require additional gains or both. Exactly. So it's rare for us to see more than four cylinders used in industry as well. So that's another fact we took into consideration. With all of these um, sales and roads, how do you deal with forward visibility from the navigation Mm, good question. Each ship, so this is much more theoretical in nature than apply. That's something if we were to actually develop and apply to a real world ship is something we would of course consider, but this is more ideally what is the greatest force that we can implement. Each ship is going to have its own characteristics to make it different. So if we had more time, we could consider that. Other questions? Thank you very much.